How are you all doing today? Thank you so much for joining us on another Sunday or whenever you're watching in the week, ready to worship and hear from the Word of God. It's so good just to be able to join together, whether that's in person or here on YouTube. We're so glad that you could join with us to meet with the living God. Um, just to let you know, if you haven't joined with us many times before or you've never done this, then please head over to our website, which is Emmanuel Church london.org and click say hello we would love to hear from you we'd love to know who you are and what you're doing and be able to get in touch with you with a more personal hello so why not head over to our website now there's also loads of other information there for you about who we are as a church and how you can get involved we're going to start our time together with worshiping god it's the best place to start and i want to read some verses from psalm 18 and i'm going to go part way down Psalm 18 and I'm going to kick off at uh, verse 16. So if you have a Bible then uh, feel free to grab that now but if not I'm going to read them to you uh, here. So it says uh, Psalm 18 verse 16 it says he God reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into spacious place and he rescued me because he delighted in me. I just thought today what a brilliant place to start in worship however you're feeling right now whether you feel like yes I'm in a spacious place and life is good and I feel peaceful or if you feel more like the person who wrote this psalm which is talking about feeling like uh, being in deep waters and 
kind of feeling lost and very troubled. However you are feeling, our God, he is a rescuer and he delights in rescuing us and we all need that rescue from him. And it says he delights in you. So as you worship today, let's come before him knowing that he is our rescuer, but also that he delights in you and he delights in hearing your worship to him. So let's worship together. We worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Sing it again. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. Parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung up upon that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise Yes, well, it's so good to worship together. We're going to continue worshiping a little bit later, but just a few things that we would love for you to be aware of in the life of the church is that uh, we're going to be actually joining with an organisation called CAP, and that stands for Christians Against Poverty. It's a national kind of charity, Christian charity, uh, that helps people that have got into real financial difficulties and that need rescuing from debt. So as we read that psalm, 
Psalm earlier about God rescuing us. We want to be an example of that to those who also feel like they need a bit of rescuing. And so we're going to be partnering with the uh, CAP Centre that's specifically in Greenwich. And we've got this for you to give you a bit more of an idea about CAP and what it does. I didn't want to let my kids down. You know, I, I didn't want to um, have it where they lost their roof over their heads or the food in their belly uh, or where I couldn't look after them anymore. My mental health took a turn for the worse. I, um, I had to seek some professional help. Darkness and depression are the two words I would use in that time. So my name's Anthony. I'm a father of two. I hit financial difficulty around about the early stages of March 2019. I have autism and um, I have to self-manage that majority of the time anyway. We were always working in a deficit. Um, my expenditure was more than my income, but through no fault of my own. It wasn't through fancy buying or anything like that. It was literally, my gas has gone up, I, it's 200 quid, I've only got 150, but I also need to do a food shop. So you're left then having to try and find the balance. Something's got to give, and that's where I started accruing quite large sums of debt. It was a lot harder during lockdown than I've ever had it. It became very lonely, it became very isolating. Trying to help them with the extra needs which would be provided by a school, would be provided by a playgroup or something like that. And also having to uh, deal with my disability, so I'm um, having to try and keep myself in check to make sure I'm coping well. We also had to shield my daughter as well because she has strong asthma. Got to a point where I couldn't even afford bread and milk. Um, and I was always being faced with the question of fuel versus food or clothes or something like that. You, you know, sometimes you just want to stay in bed, but you can't because you've got your kids. You've got to get up, you've got to get on with the day. Times at night would be spent not sleeping, but crying sometimes, sobbing into my pillow. I, I came to a point where even my life itself was under question. I didn't see a way out. I was left um, feeling like hopeless with it. Um, feeling like, where, where, where is the solution to this? I need the solution fast. And uh, I didn't see it. So uh, little did I know in the background, my mum was um, sponsoring CAP uh, with a gift aid donation um, towards uh, the work that they do. Um, when I approached my mum saying I felt like I couldn't cope, she guided me towards the website and the hotline. So I picked up the phone to call CAP and that's when everything changed. I had a person answer the phone who was um, very sympathetic, empathetic. Um, they put me in touch with a local debt coach. We went through the process of becoming debt free. Uh, I went bankrupt during the early part of lockdown. Um, and uh, that's not always the solution, but that was my solution. I got a phone call, um, but there was a great celebration in the background, a round of applause for being debt free. Um, and it made me feel like I was part of something. Now becoming part of the society again, I just felt happy. I felt, I felt the hope was there. We then went through the stages of looking, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? Um, so there's a prevention tactic that we drew up um, to help um, learn to re-budget. I'm now starting to get some savings, a small amount each time, but it's a step forwards. I'm now starting to stand on my own two feet, which is what I wanted from the get-go. All along the way, after making that phone call, I had Cap working alongside me. You know, they even phone me up now, and they'll phone me up just out of the blue and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, you know, is there anything you need or um, how are you getting on? That weight that I talk about on my shoulders was now being shared and, uh, and it became lighter and lighter. Um, you know, being debt free means an awful lot, but being able to control my finances means a lot more. And that's where I'm at. I'm now at the point where the darkness isn't as dark anymore. I have credit on my meter 
Uh, I have food in my cupboard. My children, I now can safely say, go to bed with a full stomach. Um, that, as a parent, you know, alleviates a lot of stress. Um, and it, it does make you feel stronger and happier. For me, I suppose I can now focus more on being daddy rather than being the person that is hiding a secret. You know, so I feel that my kids, without them even knowing, get more of an open person from me now than ever before. Great, well hopefully that gives you a bit more of an idea of some, some of the wonderful work that CAP does and we're just really excited as a church to be starting to kind of partner with them and be involved with them and um, we've got loads more to share about CAP and some of the work that they do as we go forward but we'd just love to just to start introducing you to that charity and all that they stand for, just really excited about that. Um, we're going to be hearing from Ben today who's actually going to be concluding a, a mini-series called Sex in our Foundation series looking at 1 Corinthians. So we're excited to hear from Ben who's going to be talking on the subject of singleness. So over to him. Great stuff. So today we're looking at the subject of singleness and uh, this is in our mini series on sex, but also in the series that we're looking at across the course of the year called Foundations. And I just really want to remind us, church, that actually when we look at the subject of singleness, that this is a subject for all of us, whether you're married or whether you're single, that actually what I'm wanting to say today is for every single one of us. And we all need to embrace this subject in order for us to have a really clear understanding about what's singleness is and what the Bible says about it and the gift that it is to us as a church and to the world as well. I don't want us to switch off if we're married. In fact, I want us to embrace this talk and there's a lot of content today that I think is going to be helpful for you. The other thing that I just want us to remember when we're working through this foundations um, journey, this series that we're looking at this year, is that what we're trying to do as a church is we're trying to build life, build foundations that we can build our lives upon and those foundations are the word of God, his authority. And today when we talk about singleness, when we talk about anything on the subject of sex or any other subject that we're looking at at the moment, it's not just some nice ideas that we've got. It's not just some musings. It's not the next cultural wave that we're wanting to jump on top of. We're wanting to work through the Bible and live lives according to what it says. And I believe that the Bible is both helpful in terms of instruction, but also helpful in terms of our experience and some of the challenges and pains that may well come with this subject. So that's not to presume that you are particularly struggling because you're single, but it may be that you are. And that's another point that's important for me just to make. Jackie Hill Perry said this, singleness isn't a punishment and marriage isn't a reward. And as I was just looking into this subject again, I think this statement is really helpful because the statement gives us a little bit of an insight to how many people in the church are thinking that singleness is somewhat of a punishment, that somehow singleness is some sort of second rate to marriage and that marriage actually is the goal that we're all aiming for. And in the church, I think it's actually right to say and fair to say that we've elevated marriage to such a degree that single life has suffered, that single understanding and what it is to live a fruitful and free and happy, sustained life as a single person pursuing Jesus has suffered because of the culture often that we've uh, embraced and, and created inside the church. A lot of what we're going to cover today um, is straight out of the, the scripture that I'm going to read, straight out of the Bible, just to say on this subject, there's so many places that we could go and so many things that I'm not going to be able to, to cover today. I'm also really aware, as I've said earlier, when we're speaking to both singles and marrieds on this subject, that all of us are going to be coming from different experiences, different wins in life and different challenges in life. And so I don't want to presume uh, whoever you are watching today, where you're at, but I do want to say this, is that I do think that these verses are going to help you no matter where you're at if you are pursuing Jesus. So let's read through the scripture together uh, and then let's try and unpack it a little bit as I go. So it says this, we're in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and we're starting in verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but give judgment as one who the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. 
I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if betrothed, if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Right from the outset in these verses, Paul is re-emphasizing that both singleness and marriage is good in the eyes of God. But he goes on. Is he going to go on to sort of say, but if you don't get married, it's going to be absolutely awful? No, listen up to this. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I want to spare you of that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as if they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as if they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away, and I want you to be free from anxieties. Paul is wanting to encourage the listeners, particularly when he gets to this part of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that Jesus Christ is coming again. What he's saying is that our time as we know it is short, whether we live a full life right to the end into old age or whether Jesus comes again before we get to old age, the time in the grand scheme of eternity is short and Paul wants to remind us of that. Why? Because it's important during this short amount of time that we focus on Jesus and what he's saying right from the outset in these verses is that actually marriage can be a really big distraction when it comes to a life that's devoted to Jesus. Let's read on. It says the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And it, sorry, I lost my, my rhythm. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, but to be holy in body and in spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So don't miss what Paul's not saying here. It's, it's not that Paul's trying to sort of say that marriage is irrelevant and you shouldn't get married. We know that, and we talked about that last week, that marriage is a good thing. What he's saying is, whether married or unmarried, devotion to the Lord is the most important thing. And actually, when you get married, that there's other responsibilities that come into your life that can be a great big distraction from your devotion to the Lord. His emphasis here is he's trying to get people to focus on Jesus and the pursuit of Jesus, both in marriage and in singleness. Let's just finish these verses off together. It says, If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It's not a sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but is having his desire under control and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Paul finishes these verses, it would seem to say, not that singleness is a second-rate citizen in the people of God, not to say that you're going to live a long, lonely life. He finishes by saying that actually singleness can even be better than married life. It may not feel like that in the culture that we have within the church, and that is exactly what I want to try and address today. So what the Bible says when Paul's writing to the Corinthians here, what he is saying quite clearly is that singleness is a gift. He says earlier in the chapter, in chapter 7, verse 70, he says this, I wish that all were, uh, were as myself, sorry, I wish that all were as I myself am. In other words, I wish everyone was single like me, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So Paul's saying that singleness, like himself, is a gift, but marriage also is a gift. Now, when I start talking about singleness being a gift, for some of you, you're dying where you're watching. You're thinking, oh my goodness, Ben, please don't go there again and start talking about singleness being a gift. This gift is like a curse to me. For some of you, you're thinking, no, Ben, please don't go there. 
talking about the, the gift of singleness and, and, and it almost being like some kind of superpower that I've never really quite understood what is meant. And I want to get into that. And, and there's three things that I'll just say right from the outset. First of all, that when we talk about singleness being a gift, that it can be a misunderstanding of the gift. And actually, I think predominantly in church life, that can actually come from married couples rather than singles, where when we talk about singleness being a gift, we forget that Paul's talking about both marriage and singleness being a gift. And what we say is that singleness is this gift and it's almost like a superpower that somebody all of a sudden has got no desire to be sexually active at all, that they just float around from place to place as an individual, not needing friendship, not needing intimacy with anybody. And they have this superpower where they're just able to walk with the Lord in absolute purity. That is not what the Bible is saying when it comes to the gift of singleness. The gift of singleness is the opportunity to completely devote oneself to the Lord without distraction of marriage. The gift of singleness is to serve the church and to love the church and at the drop of the hat, be able to be inside someone's home who's love it, who's grieving and, and being able to love them and draw attention to them without being distracted by other things. The gift of singleness is something that Paul is saying, it has served me well to be single because I've been undivided in my attention to Jesus. It doesn't mean though, that being single doesn't have its challenges. It doesn't mean that you just flick a switch and, and people that are single aren't in a situation where they want to have intimacy with people or it just turns their sex drive off and there's no challenge there. We need to understand that there's been a massive misunderstanding when it comes to the gift of singleness. It is not a superpower. The other thing that I'd say on the subject though, is that often it can be a case of misusing the gift. So what we hear is singles is, is that there's this gift of being single. Well, that actually marries up with the cultural narrative at the moment that is basically live life for yourself and you'll be happy. In other words, if I'm single, I'm able to do whatever I want whenever I want. And I think that that would be misusing the gift of singleness. It's a gift because we devote ourselves to the Lord, not because we get to travel the world and do whatever we want whenever we want. And the last thing that I'd say, another M, is we're missing the gift. And this is for all of us just to embrace for a moment. We're missing the beauty of the gift of singleness. And the gift of singleness needs to be upheld and honoured in the church. As much as marriage is, we need to hold up men and women who are single and are pursuing Jesus and are devoted to Jesus and honour it and respect it and encourage it. And everything that I've just said, when it comes to misunderstanding the gift, misusing the gift, and completely missing the gift, will come with all kinds of different comments, questions, and thoughts, I'm sure. And I'm not going to try and answer all of those right now. I caught up with a good friend of mine this week, a guy called Andrew Bunt, and we had a great conversation together that I think is going to help all of us just embrace this subject a little bit more. And then I'm going to try and just help us a little bit further before we finish up for today. So here's me and Andrew. Great. Well, thank you, Andrew, for joining me. I feel like we always have little catch-ups on Zoom. Been getting to know you more um, over the last couple of years, really, I guess, through New Day. But for those that don't know you, why don't you just um, let them know who you are and your context in terms of where you're based, what you do for a living, and maybe just a bit of your own context around the subject of singleness as well would be, be really helpful. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm down the southeast coast, a place called Bexhill. I serve an assistant pastor at a church here. We're a multi site church venues here in Bexhill and also just on the road in Hastings. I also work for charity called Living Out. We exist to help uh, churches, uh, people in society talk about faith and sexuality. And that kind of flows from my own experience and why, yeah, singleness is a topic I really care about. I'm a guy who loves Jesus, one of the faithful full of Jesus, and who also is same sex attracted. So, I've had to wrestle with what does it mean to be faithful to biblical teaching and to faithfully follow Jesus in the experience of same-sex attraction. And I think that means what it means for all of us, that the options available are marriage to someone of the opposite sex or celibate singleness. I'm not particularly interested in marrying one of the opposite sex. And so for me, celibate singleness seems to be what God has called me to. And so my adult life has been wrestling with, okay, what's it mean to faithfully follow Jesus and to seek to thrive and flourish as a follower of Jesus, as someone who's celibate and someone who's single. Mm, that's fantastic. Well, Thank you for joining us. I mean, just out of interest, this is, I'm going to throw a few curveballs in there. <laughs> but when you sort of say with your, your adult life, uh, at what stage did you sort of come to terms with the fact that, okay, I'm, I'm probably going to be single 
for the rest of my life. This is probably what God's called me to. Is that a recent thing? We've been wrestling with that for a while. What does what's that look like? Yeah, it's a good question. Probably in reality, actually, the my late teens was when I was beginning to face up to that. I became aware of my sexuality in young teens. Mm-hmm. Had a very sheltered Christian upbringing, and the world was quite different 15 years ago. So I didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. But I actually came to work out what was going on in my yeah mid to late teens. Kind of really had to wrestle with what does God actually say, and came to or continue to believe what I've been taught that the Bible teaches marriage is reserved for relationships of one man and one woman. And I think at that stage of my life, and still to me, I'm quite a pragmatic person. So I was kind of like, oh, that's fine. I'll be single. That'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And then kind of entered my 20s and realized it's a little bit harder, actually, <laughs> than, than that. And so I would say my early 20s were really wrestling with, okay, this does seem to what life is going to be like. Mm-hmm. How does it actually work? It was more the kind of practical side. Is this plausible? How do I find a way of yeah, thriving and flourishing as a single? So probably, yeah, my late teens, early 20s, were when I particularly wrestled with this but as for all of us in our life situations it's lifelong journeys as well and different stages of life and phases of life bring in different blessings and complexities linked to things like our singleness or our being married and so it's also an ongoing journey definitely yeah no, that's really helpful thank you i guess like one of the things that we're wanting to do today we're looking at the subject of, of singleness and one of the things in the bible obviously as we read through this these famous verses in, in one corinthians essentially is the phrase that you just used in, in singleness we can flourish and and it can be a joy and it can be a benefit both to the individual and to the people around them and I, I guess there's there's all kinds of misconceptions that have crept in to to church culture and when we're talking about singleness today we're, we're specifically talking about Christian singleness which is different to the world um, obviously the world has, has had influence on the church in terms of the way that we think and so one of the things really that I just want to be working at is, is trying to, to debunk some of the myths and, and sort of push into some of the misconceptions. And I guess for you and the journey that you've been on, then there must have been uh, a number of experiences over the years, both, both in terms of your thinking, in terms of best practice in church, but also in terms of lived out experience, comments that have been made, assumptions. I, I just wondered if you could just share a little bit on that side of things in terms of some of the misconceptions that have been around the subject of singleness. Yeah, yeah, there are loads on there. <laughs> I mean, to, two stand out, it's an interesting pairing. One would be just the misconception that singleness is this uh, kind of inherently bad thing. It's this awful, unbearable situation. And so that you, you do, as a single person, you experience that in church by people's pity, by people's expectation that when you say, you know, if you say to people you're happily single, people don't believe you. People don't believe, even in the church, they can be a happy single person. Mm. And so normally before people know my sexuality, I've you know, had the conversation, uh, maybe a newish person to the church, but a kind of a mature Christian, they say, you know, you've got a family, you're married, oh no, actually not, I'm quite happily single. And they don't believe you and say, oh no, but a few years time, you'll find someone, you know, they say, oh, I knew loads of people who were happily single until they found the right person. <laughs> There's this assumption that actually it's not possible to be happily single because it's this inherently bad thing. Mm-hmm. And that a few people might have the gift of singleness, which is this kind of superpower to endure this otherwise awful situation. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, the aim and the goal is marriage because that's where happiness is. And I think it's a huge misconception. It's a, a misconception to say the gift of singleness is a superpower to endure this awful thing because that's not how 1 Corinthians 7 talks about it. Paul says both marriage and singleness are gifts, which are the one you are living in at that time. You're experiencing that gift at that yeah. time. And actually, so therefore it should be a context in which we can thrive and flourish. And it's obviously linked to the misconception that marriage is the goal and solves all of life's problems and it's the only way to be relationship fulfilled and all that kind of stuff so i think one big misconception i've experienced a lot is this thing of singleness is this um utterly kind of awful kind of thing on the flip side though though a, a, a what might sound like a contradiction but sometimes some people have the assumption of singleness is always really easy and therefore it doesn't need to be thought about or engaged with and you know you've got lots of benefits and especially sometimes people who are married people who've got uh, young kids may be experiencing some of the strains that can uh, bring. Look on single people think, look at you. You can go and do what you want, wherever you want. You can spend your money, have what you know. And can easily overlook that, yeah, there are some real blessings in singleness, but actually there was also some real struggles. And actually it's true of both singleness and marriage. Both singleness and marriage have their really good blessings, but also have some of the struggles that come. I don't know what you mean. Well, I don't know what you're talking um, about. No, of course you don't. No, no. But other people might be able to relate, you know. Um, and so I think actually, yeah, on the flip side, the assumption that it's always easy 
and therefore that it's never something to talk about as friends and seek to bring support to and stuff yeah. is also actually an unhelpful misconception. And so what we want really is the, the reality, which any of us should see is fairly common sense and certainly the scriptural teaching yeah. of singleness like marriage is a wonderful gift from God. It really is a context you can thrive and flourish in. Yeah. But just like marriage also, it has its difficulties and stresses and strains. Yeah. So we need to be aware of both the good and the bad and seek to love and support each other in both the good and the bad. That's great. I guess one of the things that I'm just thinking as you're talking is um, really wanting just to stress that when we're talking about singleness, we're not just talking to singles. We're actually talking to the church. We're talking to a family that we're wanting to understand one another. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be lots of helpful things for singles. But when we're thinking about married couples and people, um, sort of some of the, the experiences, the uncomfortable experiences, just, just give us, I don't know, two or three just conversations that would have just made you sort of feel like, what are you talking about? Or that's her or that's really awkward. Um, yeah, yeah, just common features. So we can just understand a bit because I think the more I've looked into this subject, the more I'm like, oh man, yeah, I'm, I think I've crossed that line. I think I've said that. I think, and I just think it's yeah. helpful for us to hear. Yeah, I don't, yeah, a few favourites. Um, <laughs> when people get married, often you hear their parents and older generations talking about kind of them being sorted. I mean, the classic one is, you know, got a father, the bridal. She's sorted now, only one left. Yeah. And those of us who are single are thinking, wow, okay, so we're not, sorted what that say is totally projecting that message of this is the goal tick box you know and also it's in the message of they're now a mature functioning adult we singles are still these kind of infantile figures who are not really functioning proper adults do we get there so i think you know again it's this thing of we want to receive all the good blessings of marriage and celebrate the wonderful blessing of marriage and a wedding we're actually not doing it in such a way that we're implying it's in some sense success or greater maturity anything like that um, I think the example that I gave earlier just for people not believing there can be such a thing as contented singles yeah. and yeah and the kind of you'll meet someone later or what that actually flows into the kind of matchmaking an advantage for me as a guy who is openly same-sex attracted and wants to follow Jesus people don't tend to bother trying to matchmake me but I know from my opposite sex attracted friends that is a really common thing actually yeah. and you know it might be well meaning but again it's sending an unhelpful message potentially of this is the goal, this is the aim, this is kind of where you want to, uh, to get to with it. Yeah. And another one, to be honest, I, <laughs> I kind of try and let these things wash over me and not cling onto them. So I'm never good at thinking of the examples because yeah. also on the flip side, we are single to these. Remember, all of us in aware of life all the time say things which we look back and we regret, which are a bit clumsy and clunky, which actually weren't quite as sensitive they should have been. Yeah. And actually it's really good as a single we need to really fight not to get bitter about those things and, and not to ignore the fact sometimes things are hurtful. We need to process that. And we also need to be good at forgiving people, but actually storing up, you know, the kind of list of things people have said against me I don't like, I think is bad for our hearts. Yeah, yeah. So it's true we want to grow and get better, but actually part for us as singles as well, we want to be firmly rooted ultimately who we are in Christ, yeah. such that we aren't, aren't destroyed by those things at least. And don't yeah, that's really helpful. what would you would you just say anything into the culture at the moment i guess um just in terms of the age of marriage on, on the, the increase probably and just the embrace of individual living single life and just some of what culture would present it's almost a flip and, and we'll yeah, yeah. A bit, but is there anything that you just sort of speak into in can, can singleness be abused like is is are we sort of missing a bit of a the conversation yeah. there I think that's such a good point. Yeah, I think I'm so aware as a single person, it's so easy for me to be selfish. Mm. The reality is, you know, the single person, our culture tells this kind of you've, you've got your freedoms and you should make use of all of your freedoms. And so actually the, the ability to be completely selfish about how we use our time, our money, our resources, our home, whatever actually is, is really pronounced. And I think for Christian singles, something for us to really watch out, actually, to, to take the, the benefits and blessings and advantages of singleness, but not in a sense to make those about ourselves. So in the same way that marriage and family are meant to be outward looking, they're a blessing for each other, but they're also meant to be a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. The same is true if Hashibod is giving you the gift of singleness. It's not just for you to enjoy whatever you want and kind of in that slightly selfish way, but actually to be a blessing to other people. So an example for me recently, I... Uh, by a great gift of God made some really good new friends over lockdown because like they count intuitively who live quite nearby they'd recently joined the church and we were kind of going on lots of walks we need to walk one person kind of thing and uh, 
both the married couple, both of them at separate times said to me, we're so glad we've connected over lockdown because we don't think you would have had time outside lockdown because outside lockdown, I travel a lot for work. And um, I felt really convicted by that. I thought, gosh, how sad that these people think I wouldn't have space them in my life if we hadn't been in lockdown and hadn't been forced to be around. I thought, gosh, actually, do my friends get the dregs of my time? And I felt really convicted that just because I'm single doesn't mean I don't have relational responsibilities. And actually, you know, the travel stuff I do is, is good, I think, and it's kind of ministry stuff. I'm hopefully doing what God's calling me to do. But God's also called me to use my singleness to good for others in being a good friend as well. Mm. And actually, I want to find a much better balance, actually, of how is my singleness not just an opportunity to go and do things I enjoy, but also to really be rooted in a place and loving people and laying down my life for other people as we're all called to do, whether married or single. Mm. Yeah, well, to married people and our families, I say you have a, a great role to play, an important role to play in making singleness plausible. So often we think singleness is bad or we think singleness means loneliness. It means not experiencing love, not experiencing family. But actually in the context of church and Christian living, that should never be the case, actually. And so deep friendship, church as family, not just being who we are as our identity, but how we actually live is vitally important. And married people and families have a huge role to play with that. And I think especially for families, it's a huge role to play and, and an easy-ish role in the sense of it's not hard usually in the course of family life just uh, welcome other people into whatever you're doing. It doesn't need to do any special stuff, but actually family not be a closed off thing, but an open up thing. And so there's a, yeah, I think a real um, uh, way that married people and families can bless single people. But then for us as singles, it's very easy to sit around waiting to be uh, looked after, waiting to be welcomed into families, waiting who's going to be a family for me and make sure I've got that kind of experience of family. Mm. Forgetting that actually, we have just as much of a call from God to be family to other people as they do to us. We've got our role to play as well. And often it will look different how a single person um, kind of contributes to church family or the experience of family in church to how married people and families might do. But we've all got a role to play. Yeah. So actually I think rather than as singles, it's quite easy to sit around potentially with a bit of victim, victim mentality of uh, where is me, who's going to look after me. And actually, if we all think, actually, you know, how can I be a blessing to other people? It starts to really work. Because of course, if everyone, both married and single, was thinking primarily, how do I bless other people? How do I lay down my life for other people? How do I love and express church family? If we all did that like that, suddenly everyone would be experiencing it for themselves as well. And it would be a, a beautiful, wonderful thing. Great. Well, I hope that you found that helpful in terms of that little interview with Andrew. And um, I just want to finish by, I guess, just pointing out um, three ways, and they're not the only ways, but three ways that I think culture inside the church has probably not helped our understanding of singleness and how singleness can be fruitful and happy and a life that's fully satisfied. Number one would be this, um, a misconception that marriage is the only status that points to the gospel. Whilst again, as we talked about last week, and you've probably heard a number of times if you've been around church for any length of time, marriage, of course, is a wonderful advocate for the gospel. It points to the reality of this covenant promise between God and his people. When we get married, it's a demonstration of exactly that. As husband makes promises to wife and wife makes promises to husband, it's a beautiful expression of the gospel reality of God and his people. Singleness, though, is no lesser a form of the Christian faith, and it throws such a big punch when it comes to the truth of the gospel. It's got a loud cry when it comes to the gospel truth. We've just not allowed that voice to really come through. It's often been just a small squeak, whereas marriage has been shouting, this is the gospel. What do I mean? Well, singleness doesn't have the same... Um, approach obviously is marriage in terms of two people making vows together but in singleness what it shows us is the sufficiency of the gospel a life of an independent of, of an individual that is saying that Jesus is enough for me bar nothing an individual saying that I am completely and entirely devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, what a powerful message to demonstrate both in the life of the church and to other people that are following Jesus, but also what a statement that is of gospel truth to the world. Being able to say, I am committed to the Lord Jesus. This is why I'm making these types of decisions. 
So if you're listening to this, whether you're single and then one day will be married, whether you've been married and now are single, or you're not sure where things are going, maybe you've made the decision like my friend Andrew has, that I know that I'm going to be single for the rest of my life. I want to encourage you today, just as we talked about last week within the context of marriage, we said about husbands and wives holding fast to one another. I want to encourage you that if you are currently in a position of singleness, to hold fast to Jesus Christ and you will not be left in a place where he abandoned you, abandons you or leaves you or forsakes you. I want to also encourage you and thank you for being such a great demonstration to the people of God inside the church of devotion, devotion to Jesus Christ. Thank you for pursuing him and holding fast to him. As married couples, let us make sure that we don't just put marriage on a pedestal, just saying this is what points to the gospel, but actually let us remember that marriage points to the gospel as the singleness and both need to be embraced and encouraged. The second thing that I would just say that sometimes prevents a culture from really allowing singleness to flourish is the lie that stability really only comes when building a home with a spouse and having children. I just want to say that I don't think that's in the Bible at all. (laughs) I think that actually a stable home is a wonderful thing, both for the flourishing of a marriage and for the raising of children. And we want to pursue a stable, loving, God-centered home. That is good good. But getting stability in marriage is actually something that isn't a given, it has to be worked at. And so stability is not just gained by getting married. Don't hear what I'm not saying here. We must remember that actually our pursuit of stability is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. That's why we're doing this series on foundations, that actually the only way that we get stable lives, which by the way, doesn't mean safe lives. It doesn't mean comfortable lives. It could be lives that are very, very different to what comes to our minds when we talk about stability. If we truly want stable lives, what we're saying is that we build life upon Jesus Christ and we live our lives out with faith and obedience. And so it's really important for us to remember that, that it's a lie that comes into the church that says stability comes from building a home with a spouse and having children. The third thing that I just want to finish with by saying that this is an unhelpful view that's crept into the church that doesn't help singles flourish is that sex brings true happiness and satisfaction. When we're talking about single life within a church context, what we're talking about is very different to the world, obviously, because in a church context, what we believe is that sex is a gift that needs to be used within the context of marriage between husband and wife. Therefore, what we're saying is that Christian singleness, however long a period of time that is, is a life of celibacy. When the sexual revolution hit the Western world, sex, casual sex, became mainstream. It became uh, essentially a way of finding true freedom, expressing yourself and finding happiness. But it didn't just sort of stop there. If you think about the world that we live in now, the pursuit of sex and sexual relations is absolutely everywhere. It's good to be young, single and free. That's what the world would be saying. Think about the film, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. I'm not saying that all of you have seen it and please don't all go out and watch it necessarily. The whole context of this film is a 40-Year-Old Virgin who essentially must have something wrong with him because why on earth would you be a virgin if you're aged 40? And the whole point of the film is helping this person find their way to essentially getting happiness and freedom by losing their virginity. If as Christians we think that happiness is genuinely found in sex, then surely that's why we look often at singleness and think that's a gloomy existence and that marriage, of course, is the only way to pursue happiness because we've put sex on a pedestal. The church's response to the sexual revolution actually probably wasn't a great one. Rather than tearing down the idol of sex and actually putting sex in the context of marriage in a healthy way, we left the idol of sex up. And actually what we did is just pushed everybody into a place saying you're really only going to be happy if you get married so everyone get married quick. We know as Christians that true happiness doesn't come from sex. But often our actions, whether married or single, don't always tell the same story. It's important to understand that sex is a gift, a powerful gift, but it's in the context of marriage, but it is not the same as Jesus. Jesus is the only one who should be upheld as the true living God that can fully satisfy and bring true happiness. You won't find it in sex and you won't find it in a spouse. 
The other storyline that I just want to touch on that comes alongside the idea of sex is that the world would say that true intimacy is only found in sex. Last week, we talked about intimacy in the context of sex, and, and actually, it's a very powerful form of intimacy, and I don't want to rubbish that or disregard it at all. It is a profound way of man and woman in marriage being intimate with one another. But if we think that it's the only form of intimacy, again, we go astray. This whole idea of intimacy is a really important moment for us to just grab hold of, an important word for us to grab hold of as a church. See, the church does a great job about talking about intimacy in the context of sex, and that's right and proper. But it may seem obvious, but can we just talk about the person of Jesus for a moment? The life of Jesus. When I think about the person of Jesus, when, when any of us think about the person of Jesus, if you are a Christian here today, then if you're anything like me, you'll know that Jesus lacked nothing. And I mean nothing, including being completely satisfied and having intimate relationships. Jesus showed what it is to have true intimacy with the Father through the Holy Spirit, but also showed what it is to have intimate friendship with men and women everywhere that he went. Some of the relationships that Jesus has as you read through the Gospels in terms of friendship, none of them sexual, were absolutely remarkable. Intimacy cannot just be found in sex and sex alone. Whilst we want it to be found in marriage, it cannot just sit in that place because otherwise Jesus would have been lacking and he was lacking nothing. The writer of this letter, Paul, was in exactly the same situation. I mean, this guy literally had friends all over the known world. If you wanted to go on holiday with Paul, you were going on holiday with a good guy. He knew people in every city that would be able to put him up for the night, people that were giving him money, getting behind him, cheering him on, praying for him, eating with him, drinking with him. This guy had wonderful, intimate relationships. And church, we've forgotten that, that actually friendship is such a profound part of the Christian faith. What does Jesus call us in the Gospels? He calls us friend. I'm friend of sinners. What a wonderful thing that actually true intimacy in God through the Holy Spirit is exactly the same kind of intimacy that we can have with one another's brother and sisters in Christ. And guys, I want to just encourage us whether you're married or single, that actually we need to work harder at promoting intimacy and friendship and therefore work harder at finding true friendship within the context of the church. It doesn't mean that you've got to be bezies with every single person. I get it. There is something of mutual respect that we want to love and serve one another inside the church, but definitely inside the church, there should be men and women that you are building friendship with, where you can be completely open with, that you can share life, that you can laugh and cry and dance and what watch TV and do all of those wonderful things together. It is a form of intimacy, a gift that has come from God. Let me finish by saying this, singleness is at its best when Jesus is right at the centre. Marriage is at its best when Jesus is right at the centre. And as we pursue Jesus wholeheartedly in these different status, single or married, we will bless the church. We will bless the people around us, whether they're single themselves or married, we will be a blessing to them. But in both cases, I want to remind us that as we live out lives devoted to Jesus, that actually we will be a blessing to the world. The world will see men and women who are devoted to Jesus and they will see an expression of the gospel truth, both in singleness and in marriage. As a community, I want us to uphold remembering both marriage and singleness as a precious gift. As Paul said through these passages, we've got a short time here on earth as we know it. Jesus is coming again. And so let's make him the centre of our affection. Let's make him the centre of our devotion. Keep pursuing him and tell the world that this Jesus wants to be friends with them. God bless you. my shepherd I won't be wanting I won't be wanting He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet
highest dream that so helpful. Um, I am myself married but I just found that such a helpful reminder um, and a real challenge to me so thank you uh, so much Ben. I just really picked up as I was as listening to Ben just the importance of Jesus just being on the throne in our lives and number one position and only he can satisfy us and um, he can never disappoint us. I just love, uh, will you just join with me just to pray a prayer of just recommitting our ourselves back to God and putting our hope in him uh, to meet our needs and for him to be number one in our lives. Why don't you just join me? You might choose at this point just to pray by yourself. That's absolutely fine. But if you'd like to, then just pray along with me as well. Yeah, Jesus, we come back to you and we say, oh, Jesus, you are our all in all. You are our everything. All that we need is found in you. And so we bring ourselves back to you and we say, 
are, Jesus, forgive us for where we've looked towards other things to bring us satisfaction or fulfillment. We just so know that you are really the only one that can satisfy us and that you never disappoint us. And so we just commit ourselves back to you. We surrender to you. We say, Lord, have your way in us. Have your, let your will be done in our lives. Uh, draw us closer and deeper into your presence and overwhelm us with your love and your goodness today. We pray as we, as we run back to you with arms open wide, we know that you are so quick to come and meet us the same with your arms ready to receive us and take us on. So we just, yeah, we just want to put you back right at the centre. Say, Jesus, it's you that we love. It's you that we need. Come and Holy Spirit, as the people are watching and praying now, we just pray, come and fill people, come and show yourself to them, come and encourage hearts that are hurting or confused. We pray, just minister to people, we ask in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember that you're very welcome to get in contact with us as a church. You can find our details all on the website um, and we would love to hear from you if you think there's things that you're really struggling with or you just need a bit more of a personal walk through some of these things, then please do get in contact with us as a church is what we're about. Ben also mentioned just about kind of having good friends and friendships in the church and not making it kind of all about marriage, but to really invest in different friendships um, between men and women and in different ways and there's lots of ways as a church that we try and make that happen but but one of the most obvious ways is that every Sunday morning we turn up at the Odeon at 10 30 to gather worship and kind of get to know one another if you've not really kind of got involved more personally in the life of the church that is just such a fantastic starting place it's not everything but it's a great starting place and just to say you'd be really welcome to come and join us at the Greenwich Odeon in screen 12 at 10 30 every Sunday morning we would absolutely love to see you there if you need more information again head over to our website but it's all there ready for you and you are very very welcome otherwise we'll see you again back here next week hope you have a great week god bless